All right, so thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, Bradley Biddle is going to be our star umpire of the night. He's always our star umpire. Um, he's going to walk you through the new arena rule changes for 2015. We are going to review the nine video questions from this year's II rules test, uh, and then we'll offer a, uh, a question and answer um, portion of the night. So. Hang in there with us, and we'll get started. Don't forget, there is a chat box, so if you have any questions, we can answer them there, and we will do the best we can. Thank you. Everybody got an email on this, but I want to make sure that everybody realizes that we are not using the tournament conditions that we tested in the II clinics in the fall. Um, we are using the USPA arena rules as they have been, um, with some new changes in the actual arena rules, which I will be going over uh, here very, very shortly. So let's dive into the next slide, uh, which is the 2017 arena rules. Um, there are a couple changes this year. Uh, and they are, when you get a white book, if you haven't gotten a white book already, they are in bold in the arena rules, under the arena rules tab. All right, and the main, the main changes that we're going to be dealing with in the arena regarding play are, <clears throat> are all under Rule 14, uh, which, as you see, it says improper plan on sportsmanlike conduct. Um, the first thing we're going to go over is a delay of game, and I'm just going to read this. I'm just going to read this. A player in possession of the ball marked approximately two horse lengths or less by an opposing player must keep moving should the player in possession of the ball either stop or reduce his speed to a walk or walking speed the player and or any member of the player's team will have five seconds to either hit away or run with the ball an infraction of this rule will result in a penalty against the team in possession of the ball if the infraction occurs between the center line and goal being defended by the team in possession of the ball a penalty number four should be awarded to the other team. Okay, so this rule in the arena has changed over the years. Um, we really didn't have delay of game uh, uh, before two years ago, and then we put in delay of game, and uh, which if we called delay of game before, it was just a throw in. Um, now we are awarding the other team uh, a free hit. Um, the reason being is, is that we believe that if a player slows the game down on purpose, uh, it, is, it is better to give the other team a free hit versus a 50-50 uh, throw-in um, where the team could pick up immediate possession again. Now, when it says, uh, should the player in possession of the ball either stop or reduce his speed to a player, any member of the player's team will have five seconds to either hit away or run with the ball. Uh, I had a meeting with the II umpires uh, a week ago, and this is this is how that is going to be determined. When a player slows the ball down with a defender uh, within two horse lengths, the the umpire will have their own clock in their head of thousand one, thousand two. When they get to thousand three, the umpires will say use it. And, and what that means is, just like what we say in terms of advancing the ball, you either have to, have to take off with possession of the ball in terms of going from a walking speed to advancing to a cantering speed, or you have to hit away, okay? If you leave the ball for another player, if, if another player comes in behind and tells, you to, and tells you to leave it, the five seconds does not start over. It is that it is still in that that time frame of that first five seconds that the umpires count off. So thousand one, thousand two, use it. Thousand four, if it isn't used, if it isn't used by then, it is a whistle, and it is considered delay of game. Okay, that is, and the idea is to keep the ball moving. Um, the voice action by the umpire is a little bit different, it is, but it is meant to carry the game on. Um, I don't see us having a lot of problem with this because 
I know last year in the arena of all the tournaments I did in the II, very rarely did we ever have delay a game. Of course, I say that now. It'll probably happen five times in the first tournament. Um, but uh, the idea is to have continuous, more continuous play, and if you don't, you are penalized, and the other team gets possession of the ball with a free hit. Now, <clears throat> the last part of this last part of this says if the infraction occurs between the center line and goal being defended by the team in possession of the ball, a penalty number <clears throat> a penalty number four should be awarded to the uh, so penalty four should be awarded to the other team. What we determined is that um, if there was a delay of game that was close, that was you know kind of close to the end wall where the defender was defending his own side, that uh, giving an open goal penalty shot would be a little too severe. The idea of the free hit is to give possession to the other to the other team, but because we can't give spot hits uh, on that side because the attacking team is attacking their goal. We decided that we will make that a penalty four. Okay, um, so that is delay of game <clears throat> uh, summarized in terms of how we are going to look at it from the umpiring standpoint and what you all need to know as coaches and players. The idea is to just keep moving with the ball at the end of the day. Unsportsmanlike conduct. Now, unsportsmanlike conduct. This is a big change this year um, within. All polo indoor or arena outdoor international rules. Um, this is a big change uh, all the way around for all unsportsmanlike conduct in polo. Okay. The okay concerning unsportsmanlike conduct, the umpire will follow the procedure outlined below. Number one is a yellow flag. The umpire shall immediately award a yellow flag to a player that demonstrates unsportsmanlike conduct as described above. Um, we don't have the description from above. I will read it off in the book as it states. Um, unsportsmanlike conduct, including but not limited to the following, shall not be permitted. Okay. Appealing to the umpires or officials. Unwelcome talking to the umpires vulgar or abusive language, disrespectful attitude towards any official player, coach, or spectator, arguing with the umpires or other officials, inappropriate behavior by any member of a team organization, delay of game for a player or mount, unnecessary tack timeout, swinging the mount in a windmill or helicopter type fashion as an appealing for a foul, dangerous riding as described in Rule 13, um, improper use of the mount as described in Rule 15, rough or abusive play as described in these rules, they're liber deliberately striking another player or a mount, excessive violation of the Rule 14H whipping rule, hitting the ball after the whistle or horn has sounded, intentionally striking a ball during play in such a way that it may cause injury to a player, spectator, or official, or damage property. All right, so guys, here's the thing with the yellow flag. We the yellow flag system is much harsher than what, than what we've had in the past. Um, the red flag system um, in years past, you know, you all know the red flag system. How you know you get three red flags in a game and you're out for a chucker, um, and you can come back and you know a fourth red flag. But we also had appealing fouls. Um, and we also had a, we and we also had appealing fouls without a, a red flag. Those are done. Um, the yellow flag, if, if there's an appeal with the player, um, and when we talk about appealing, because we always seem to talk about this every year, uh, appealing is not raising your mouth in the air. Appealing is, it, I mean, that's, no, that's nine times out of ten, that's a reaction. Appealing is if you raise your mouth in the air and you stare down the umpire um, from head to toe. Okay, that's appealing. Well, now, instead of that being a... a, 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 a it's a foul, but it's also a yellow flag, okay? So much much harsher in terms of things like that, but also uh, with the yellow flag, you have you also have dangerous riding, dangerous use of mallet. Those are all those are those all can be yellows. Now we have different degrees of dangerous riding and dangerous use of mallet. 
um, that we can use umpire discretion on whether or not we give a yellow flag. Okay, just to give you an example, if two players are together and a person takes a hard, you know, say they take a hard neck shot and it goes under the neck of the horse um, without making contact on the other side. Well, Daniel, we can, we can as, as umpires, uh, our discretion is to be that, okay, we know it was dangerous use of mallet. <clears throat> there was not any contact with the dangerous use of mallet, but we know it was wrong because it went under the horse's necks. Okay. Now, let's say that same play happens and it swings up, hits the horse on the other side, hits the other player in the hand or the face or something like that. Absolutely a yellow, a yellow flag. Okay. Um, dangerous riding. You know, there's always plays where we have uneven ride-offs in the arena. It happens all the time. <clears throat> um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's determined, it's very, it's, it's, it, you know, we, we have to determine the degree of how the horse is jostled in terms of whether or not it is determined to be a dangerous riding with a yellow flag or just dangerous riding. We have to maintain umpire discretion, guys and guys and girls, in this because we know we we know how the arena is. We know how the kids are um, in terms of 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 the processes and some of the horses and things like that. But the idea is, uh, unless it gets really severe, we're we're not we're not out we're not out to to remove the kids from the arena. So, and the II umpires have been told this. We will reiterate this again at every tournament meeting um, before each, before each, but the, the prelims, regionals, and nationals, the umpires have been instructed to go over these again. Um, but the biggest thing, coaches, that I want you to remind your kids is that there's no warnings. There's, there, we, we don't have warnings. Um, and so they've got to know right off the bat. Okay, so that's kind of the idea of what we're looking for in a yellow flag. Um, here is, here's how the offenses work with that. All right, the player's first yellow flag offense in a game, this is 1A, the player's first yellow flag offense in a game will result in a penalty and may increase or decrease an existing penalty severity. It's pretty much like how a red flag was. Same, same kind of thing, okay? All right, it says B, a second offense will be a second yellow flag and the player will sit out for uh, either the remainder of the period or until the first play stoppage that occurs following the next two, minute of, two minutes of play. I'm going to stop there because the National Host Tournament Committee decided that uh, we will use 1BI, the remainder of the period. So this is a very, it's, it, it, this is, this is a, you know, if you get the second yellow flag, um, you will be sitting out for the remainder of the... Now we come to the next one. The player's third offense is now a red flag in a game, and that will result in suspension for the remainder of the game with no su substitute allowed for either the remainder of the period... I'm, I'm not even going to say either. It's with no substitute allowed for the remainder of the period, which is I, okay? <clears throat> And then, of course, now the thing is, is, is that let's say this happens in the third chucker, okay? In the third chucker, and you know, player gets player gets dismissed uh, for the rest of the game. You are, if you have an eligible substitute available, you will be allowed to bring them in for the fourth chucker. If you receive a red flag. And you're out for that game. You are also down for the next game. Okay, that is that is universal in terms of our disciplinary rules and in, in all polo with the United States Polo Association. Okay. Um, also, under B, if a player demonstrates unsportsmanlike conduct after the game ends. Uh, the umpire shall award a yellow flag, and the player will start his next game with a yellow flag. This penalty may be increased by the by the national host tournament committee and or the association. Uh, if the player has no remaining games in the event, the penalty will be carried over to the first game of the player's next tournament, uh, next inter intercollegiate or scholastic tournament, not of equal or higher handicap because that doesn't apply to us. Um, 
so yeah, this the, the disciplinary system has changed. Um, it is, as I said before, uh, there's not a lot of leniency uh, in terms of the yellow or red flags. Um, so just remind your kids that you know they've got to be on their best behavior. Also with the also with the coaches, I just saw I just saw a question come up. Um, the coaches actually, if a coach gets a yellow flag, that's a team technical. It does not get assigned to a player because you cannot hold a player responsible for their coach in the II. So if a coach gets his first yellow flag, it's going to be a penalty as described in, in the first part, um, moving it up or moving it back, depending on who it's against. Um, if a coach receives a second yellow flag, the coach will be removed from the arena and the immediate playing area for the remainder of the game. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be off the premises, but you cannot be in a viewing area of the arena where you are actively working with your kids. It's uh, kind of like in basketball when the coaches get sent to the lockers. Um, you'll get sent to the trailers. Okay? That is, the, uh, that is what we've determined. Um, and we've had some emails that have gone back and forth, and we're in the process of fixing that up, but that was what was determined um, by the NHTC uh, regarding coaches. All right. So actually, you know what, guys, let's, let's, let's run. Is there any quick questions um, on these two things? Let's go ahead and do that, because by the time we get done with the video, somebody might have forgotten something. And John Schneider, uh, appreciate that quick question that you wrote. Um, I hope that cleared that up. So, so the next part we're going to go through are the videos from this year's II rules test. Question number one is, um, which foul occurred at the end of this clip? And the answers are A, foul against red for one meeting two, B, foul against blue for riding an opponent, opponent across the right away of another player, and C, foul against red for improper ride off. Um, on this play here, uh, uh, red, red maintains possession of the ball. They're going towards the goal. Um, the blue player brings uh, the red player in front into the red player behinds right away. Um, that's two players coming in at a greater angle to, <clears throat> to the line of the ball versus the player that had the line of the ball and violated the right away. So the answer is. B, foul against blue for riding an opponent across the right away of another player. Number two, what is true about the foul at the end of this video? A, foul against red, he had no play on the ball. B, foul against blue for a crossing violation, he had no play on the ball. C, foul against blue for a right away violation, he should have flattened out to the line and hit the ball on his near side. I remind you, this is the foul at the end of the video. I was looking at the beginning of the video and I was like, hmm. Okay, so it's very, it's pretty clear on this play here. That ball is actually, it's an open back shot uh, hit by the red red player. It's coming straight at us at the camera angle. Red drops on it. Uh, blue goes over the uh, <clears throat> goes over the ball to take an offside back shot that violates reds right away. That player should have stayed on the near side, flattened out. So therefore, the answer is C. Foul against Blue for a right away violation. He should have flattened out to the line and hit the ball on his near side. All right, number three. In this penalty 5A, A, foul against the orange hitter for meeting the red player coming out of the goal. B, foul against the red player in the goal for one meeting three. C, offsetting fouls on the red slash orange pair for dangerous riding. All right, as you can see, the number three, the, the blue player is bringing the ball towards the goal. Um, the red player comes out to defend. Uh, the red player actually in front is, is okay. It's the red player that's behind that pushes the blue player across the ball uh, is the one that's wrong on this play. So, you know, once again, we talk about these angles with two players. That's a greater angle. And so, therefore, <clears throat> that is a – that is the answer would be it's a foul against the red player in the goal for one meeting three. It's technically one meeting two. And also the red player pushing for dangerous riding, pushing the blue player uh, into the play across across the line. That is the answer B. All right, number four. What should red number one do at the end of this clip to avoid fouling? 
Uh, a, switch to the near side. B, allow the blue player behind her to catch up, ride her off, and take the near side. C, flip the ball towards the goal on her offside, allow blue to clear, then drop on the new line. And D is both B and C. Okay, on this play with uh, the, the Cornell Red number one, um, she's approaching the ball. She's approaching the ball as it goes to the end wall. She wants to flip it to the side, but she doesn't realize that there's a player coming behind. Uh, number three uh, in blue, and the appropriate thing to do is one of two things, either for her to catch up, take her on her hip, and, and take the ball on the near side, but she has to give her, and the other, the other part of it is that she has to let the blue player behind, because she does what's called a quick line change, the nearest point of exit, um, which I would say the nearest point of exit would be directly to her right, um, without without making a play on the ball. The player in the front is responsible for the safety of the player behind in this instance. So therefore, the answer would be D, both B and C. Those would be the two better options um, to for red number one to make that play. All right, which foul occurs at the end of this clip? A, foul against orange for dangerous riding sandwich, foul against white for improper write-off, uh, C, foul against orange for shading. At the end of number five, um, there ended up being a, a situation where two players, two of the orange players came on both sides of uh, the player in the middle, and therefore that's a sandwich foul against orange for dangerous riding, uh, comma, sandwich. A is the answer. Look at the end of the clip, not the beginning of the clip. Yeah. Right there, that was a sandwich. Right there at the end, there was, that was a sandwich there, okay? That is, that is A. Number six, in this penalty three, which player has the line of the ball and right away on his offside when the ball bounces off the ball, off the wall, excuse me. A, blue, B, red. Uh, this play, what happened was that the, uh, there was, a, I believe the blue player hit the ball in a penalty three, the ball bounced to the right, uh, bounced at an angle, angle back out into the arena where the red player was able to drop on it 100%. The blue player violated the right away, and therefore it, the answer is B, red. All right, number seven. At the end of this video, A, foul against red for right away violation after the shot. B, foul against white for not riding off red and taking the ball on his near side. C, no foul. Red made a clean play on the ball. All right. This play here, red has main, it maintains control of the ball. It ends up being popped up to the right. Uh, the white player comes and follows that ball, follows the line of the ball. The red player uh, attempts to make a play on the near side, but does not flatten out. Violates the uh, white player's right away, so therefore it is a foul against red for right away violation after the shot. Answer A. All right, number eight, what could the player, blue player have done to prevent fouling at the end of this clip? A, hit the ball on his near side. B, get behind the play. C, hook the player his teammate was riding off. D, all of the above. On that play, you have two players coming down uh, with the right away. The one player comes in at a greater angle. Um, so it says number eight, what could the blue, hair have done, blue player have done to prevent fouling at the end of this clip? Pretty much everything but what he did. So D, all of the above is the answer. Hit the ball on his near side without, with flattening out, he couldn't have hit the ball on his near side and still traveled over those two, those two players right away. Um, get behind the play, that's, that's, yeah, obviously, and hook the player his teammate was riding off. And, you know, that's another thing, guys, and I, and this is something, there's no such thing as two on one. Like if those two, these two players behind are together, that blue player could have come in and made a near side hook on that red player as long as his teammate on the other side was not pushing him over the line. So that's there's no such thing. And I've heard, you know, some umpires in the past call it two on one. There's no such thing in our rule book. So that would have been a legal play. So the answer is D all of the above. So there was a question in clip A would have been a stretch to call the for the first blue player for entering the right away after missing the ball, considering where the red bullet player was. Yeah, that's a stretch. And you, Brandon, you answered your own question. Um, yeah, it would have been a stretch. That that was he was safe enough in front to uh, to to pull over the uh, to pull over the other player's right away because there was enough gap there. 
Number nine, at the end of this video, A, foul red, crossing the right away after the shot. B, foul green, dangerous riding. C, foul red, dangerous use of mallet. All right, number nine, at the end of this video, foul red, crossing the right away after the shot. Um, um, the red goes in to attempt to make a back shot, and basically when she makes her back shot, um, she makes an ab abrupt turn with her horse uh, across the player behind her, and the player has to check up to avoid a collision. Um, the best thing for the red player would do to do is to be continue continue along the wall uh, versus you know making the turn along the wall versus making that abrupt change before she got to the wall. So therefore, that's foul red crossing the right away after the shot. Answer A. We had a question. Uh, will delay of game be enforced on the wall, specifically corner to goal? Um, David, it depends on the, it depends on, there, there's a number of things you have to think about with delay. We have to think about with delay a game because, you know, the intercollegiate finals are not going to be the same speed as the interscholastic prelims. So the flow of the game is going to determine how delay a game is going to be called. So if you have kids that are, you know, in a walk trot game, Obviously, we're not going to give delay a game unless it comes to an absolute halt. Um, if the kids are maintaining it, maintaining along the wall, but you know, really, in along the wall, we kind of already have this um, in our rules with pace of play. You know, because if you have the ball along the wall and you're and you're taking your time with it, but if you've got players coming in behind you and all of a sudden you check up and slow down, well, you're creating danger in front of the train coming behind you, whether it be two players, four players, or what have you, so that's a foul. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but to answer your question, David, it's going to depend on the speed of the game. Um, that's why we have the tool as umpires to say, use it. I think that'll help them along, realizing that they know they have to, they have to either increase speed or hit away. Um, but the answer is, in terms of being enforced, it's going to be enforced uh, in any in any area of the arena. Got a question from Frank Stubblefield. Uh, it says, "Can you explain shading?" Um, shading is not really a term that I like to use from a standpoint of of what we do. I know a lot of you hear it probably on the USPA Polo Network. Um, it's really blocking the right away. Uh, violation of the right of way. Um, I think you know, you know, shade, shading is kind of a is kind of a gray area play, um, you know. But in our terms of rules and how we do it, uh, it's a violation of the right of way, a blocking the right of way. So I don't. So to ask me to explain it, I don't like to because I don't like to use the term. Okay, Liz asked. You said at the beginning that we won't be using the tournament conditions originally discussed. What happened? Liz, to answer your question, um, it was it was decided upon by the uh, NHTC, along with help from the Umpire LLC and the Arena Rules Subcommittee, because we changed the uh, the tournament. We we tried different things from UVA to Central Coast to Cornell. So, and we are now in the process of having a meeting every two weeks with the Arena Rules Subcommittee, continuing to change change some things with those tournament conditions because as we're seeing, you know, the Townsend Cup used them, the military tournament used them, they're using them in the Gladiator Polo. Of course, that's a whole different animal because that's more of an exhibition. But anyway, it was our feeling that with the NHTC that Chris Green and I both went to them and said that we want to continue working on this. We want to get them right. Uh, we want to get them as close to we can, as close as we can, 100% correct before we uh, we we, impl we implement them going forward in the II. Now, one thing that I guys told I told a lot of you guys before that these were probably going to be rules in 2018. That's more than likely not the case. They're going to continue to be tournament conditions. Um, we're going to continue to vet them. Hopefully, by next year's II season, we will have vetted them enough. Um, we uh, we we think we have vetted them enough, but they're still going to be tournament conditions. So it'll be another decision when we come back around you know, with the NHTC to decide whether or not we want to use the tournament conditions. But 
I know I will feel a heck of a lot better with them after after getting the you know continuing these meetings that we're doing um, going forward. I mean, I'm very excited about them. I don't know if anybody you guys the guys watch watch the Townsend Cup. The the, the two pointer, the twenty five made a big difference. It was pretty neat. So. Don't forget about your timeouts, guys. Remember, you're in a, you know, we have our two timeouts, one timeout per half, uh, 90 seconds. When you, uh, when the team calls timeout and you make your way to your coaches, uh, that's when the 90 seconds will start. And we will blow a whistle about 10 seconds before uh, the end of the 90 seconds for the players to come back. And also remember, if you do a substitution, you lose your, a substitution during the first or second half you lose your timeout. That is your timeout. And that's on a dead ball. That's on a dead ball or after after a goal is scored. Right, Emily, isn't that right? Yeah, after a goal is scored too. I think. Yep. And Hannah, your team captain rides up to the umpire and calls the timeout. That is correct. Great. If anyone doesn't have any other questions, I definitely want to echo Steve Wayne. Bradley, thank you very much. You did a great job tonight. But thank you all very much for coming in, and we will see you in a couple weeks. Good luck. Thank you, everybody. Um, look forward to seeing you all throughout the country this year. Any questions, send me an email, okay? Thank you. <laughs>